Let's stand and worship the living God today. There is a river where goodness flows. There is a fountain that drowns sorrow. There is an ocean deeper than fear. The tide is rising, rising. There is a current stirring deep inside. It's overflowing from the heart of God, the flood of heaven. Crashing over us, the tide is rising, rising. Bursting, bursting up from the ground, we feel it now. Bursting, bursting up from the ground, we feel it now. We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. we come to you today Lord just work in our hearts today work in your church Lord Lord may may hearts be moved may souls come to see your light may those who are spiritually dead come to life with the power of Jesus Christ in your precious name we pray 
Amen. The doghouse. Put him in the dog. Oh, look at that right there. Right up front, girl. Come on. Did somebody, did somebody tell you? Did somebody at all? The Lord said, I got to get to church today. People are going to be praying for me. They're going to be looking for me. They're going to want to know who I am. And there you are, Evelyn Santana. God bless you, baby. So glad that you're here. How might we pray for you? Look at that picture of yourself there. Is that, that's it. Look at the big I, smile. I haven't aged a bit. No, not at all. You're looking great, girl. You're looking great. How might we pray for you as a church family? Uh, my family. Your my family, daughters, yes. Daughters, my parents. Daughters and parents. I've been caregiver for the past couple of months. Caregiver to and the parents. My parents yeah. and caregiver. my, of course, my children. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why you guys haven't seen me. Mm -hmm. I take care of them. God takes care of me. Mm -hmm. And just when you think you can't carry on. Keep Carry going, on or get approaching more, burnout, you can't just yeah. get more. Yeah, the Lord just but keeps we you. just keep going. And I thank you all for your prayers. Mm -hmm. God bless each and every one of you. We'll keep praying for you, girl. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Let's pray for our dear sister. Father, we just want to come before you with thanksgiving and praise for Evelyn, Father, and pray that you might continue the good works that you've already begun within her. Father, I appreciate her testimony, Father, that in her moments of weakness, you would be her strength. Father, even in those moments when she's confused or feeling tired and weak, Father, that you would bring clarity and discernment, Father, to her. And Father, I pray that she would make uh, good decisions to bring you honor and bring you glory as she serves others, as she serves her family, as she serves her children. Father, I pray your blessing upon her. May she recognize the hand of God upon her. And Father, may she realize she has brothers and sisters walking right along with her, that experience everything with her, that, that walk with her, that encourage her, Father, that Father, that are continue to uphold her before you. And Father, we look for the ways in which you're going to do great and amazing things in her and through you, through her, Father, for your honor and for your glory. And Father, we just love our dear sister and pray that you would continue to honor her. And Father, we come before you in the name that is above all names, the sweetest name, the name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen.
up and greet each other this morning. It's great to be here. It's great.
Looking into 
Spirit, fill this place. Lord, we come to you today in praise of you, the almighty, glorious God. We give all glory, honor, and praise to you, Lord. Jesus, dwell in our hearts today. Guide us in your ways, in your truth, Lord. Speak through your people. Speak through your church. And may your will be done. We are yours, Lord. We are your children. Lord, remind us of that every day. In your precious name we pray. Amen. calendar the other day, Easter comes early. It's like the end of March, right? We're going to do an Easter breakfast? We should do an Easter breakfast, right? It's the way we usually do, do an Easter breakfast. Uh, do an Easter breakfast, Palm Sunday, March 24th. That's like a few weeks coming up. So you know, we're also in that part where many Christians would call Lent. So the 40 days leading up to the death of Christ. Many Christians are following Lent. And our scripture is, if you soap this week, it's kind of in that time frame. It's actually in the last week. But if you want to fast and if you want to observe Lent, I recommend the words of St. Francis. Fast from hurting words, say kind words. Fast from anger, be filled with peace. Fast from pessimism and be filled with hope. Fast from worries and trust God. Fast from compliments, excuse me, fast from complaints <laughs> and contemplate simplicity, St. Francis. Fast from bitterness, be filled with joy. Fast from selfishness and be compassionate. If you want to observe Lent, fasting from something, fast from grudges and be reconciled. Fast from words and be silent and listen. Thank you there, St. Francis. Appreciate that. In fact, this week's uh, soap passage is kind of like I already mentioned, Jesus' last week. It's kind of within that Lent kind of scenario. And that's the, we call that the week of passion. Or Passion Week. So we have all these events going on. Lent, Passion Week, and the timing of this passage is really just after Palm Sunday. There's a whole other one going on. Palm Sunday. And he triumphantly enters into Jerusalem. Jesus rode into town on a donkey, fulfilling the scripture that declares that this is what the Messiah would do. And he rides into town on the donkey, and he goes straight to the governor's house. Nope. Declaring he's political leader. Nope. He rides into town and he goes to the general's house. Declaring that he will now be the military leader. No, that's not what he does. He, he goes to the chief's priest's 
house and says, I am now the religious leader. Of... No, that's not what he does. He rides into town on a donkey and he goes to the temple. Why would he go to the temple? What's going on? It's Passover. It's Passover. Jerusalem is filled with people. It's Passover and a celebration of Passover. Passover, the release, of, the release of bondage and slavery and captivity. And all of Jerusalem is celebrating. And he rides into town and he goes to the temple. And he essentially just teaches and talks. That's a whole other celebration that's going on amongst Passion Week and, right, and Lent. There's Passover, Palm Sunday. There's all this stuff is going on. I hope that you find some reasons to celebrate God. There's plenty of reasons to celebrate God. People will often say to me, you know, Pastor, you know, I hear this all the time, you know, if Jesus were alive today, he'd be hanging out on the street corner with the drug dealers and the prostitutes. I say, absolutely. And he would go to church. Absolutely. He went to synagogue. Jesus went to temple. Jesus went to church. Church is his idea. You don't go to church. What are you saying about God's idea? You got your own ideas. You're not following God's ideas. You're following your own ideas. Jesus went to church. So we've been progressing through some of the core values of the alliance, core values. So we've gone through, uh, which, which was our missions one, lost people matter to God. He wants them found. And does what matters to God matter to you? That'll be some of the points even today. I'll mention some of that. And then last week, was it last week? Last week is, does anybody remember last week's? I could preach the same sermon every week. And it's, I don't know why I work so hard at this. Prayer is the primary work of God's people. Somebody who takes notes, I love it. Prayer is the primary work of God's people. We spent some time in prayer. Talked about prayer and, the, and peace with God and the peace of God, right? Today, here's your next slide. Everything we have belongs to God. We are his stewards. Jesus will go to temple every day. For that upcoming week. He doesn't go to the general's house. He doesn't go to the governor's house. He doesn't go to the chief priest's house. He goes to the temple every day. This is probably midweek. The soaping passage. Probably a Wednesday or a Thursday. It's the middle of the week. He's already overturned some tables. He probably does that more than once. Dallas, we think it's only once. He probably does that more than once. You have turned my house of prayer into a den of thieves. Right? Now the Pharisees, remember, this place is packed. There's people everywhere. They're celebrating Passover. And the Pharisees and the teachers, they're irate. They are furious. This is the height of the tourist season. This is when we make all our cash, baby. Why are you throwing tables over? And, what, and, and they're questioning everything about Jesus. And they're, they're irritated and angry because people are following him. They're listening to him. And the Pharisees want to, they try to stir things up, try to cast doubt upon who he is and his teaching. They, they question his authority. Well, who are you to do such things? They question his heritage. They challenge him about paying taxes. They challenge him about marriage. They challenge him about the resurrection. They're trying to trip him up to discredit him trying to get, cause a rift so that, that people will stop following him. They would cast doubt upon his character. Listen, this is verse, this is the end of chapter 20. This wasn't part of your soap. I think I asked Jody to put it up there. Can we do that? While, while all the people were listening, there's people everywhere, while all the people were listening, he speaks to his disciples. Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around with the flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for a show, they make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. 
Listen, this is sets up the soap passage, right? This sets up the soap passage. That sets the background. And just then, Jesus looks up. This is your soap. And Jesus looked up. And he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. And truly, I tell you, he said, this widow put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she did out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. There it is. Coincidence? Amidst the teachings, like God had a plan. And he does. There's lots of lessons going on just in those few passages. Of, if you can kind of catch the imagery of what's happening all around you and where everybody's set into the disciples and the Pharisees and the crowds and Jesus. He just, he, he looks up and he notices something. If you would just look, if you would just look, you will see spiritual things going on in your life all the time. Stuff is already going on and taking place in and around your life. God is alive and God is everywhere. Am I right? Wealthy show off and look for adulation. The humble go quietly about the Father's business. Some things may not seem always so, so coincidental. Some things have a really deeper purpose. A teachable moment, maybe, that God wants to show you that you've, that's gone unnoticed because you didn't look up or you're too caught in other stuff. Or a moment even to share or show with someone else. I know this about Jesus. He didn't miss his moments. He didn't miss his moments. And many moments were probably created simply because he was God. And things were, right, divinely ordered. But there are moments. They're just moments. And Jesus doesn't miss them. He takes them. He says, God can do something right here and right now. And see, Jesus notices, right? Jesus sees all we do. He sees all we don't do. He sees all we give. He sees all we don't give. When we could have done better, but we didn't. When we should have done, but we ignored. Jesus notices. And Jesus notices at this moment in time, in the temple, and in the temple treasury, with all the crowds, with all the challenges, with all the stuff going on, he notices something that's eluded him in that place. He notices this widow. And what does he notice? He notices her heart. Jesus sees your heart. He notices amidst all the people, all the noise, all the crowd, all the disciples, all, all the questions and all the pressure and all, all the stuff that's filling the air, he notices a lonely widow giving two pittance. I mean, really. There's chaos everywhere. Voices of the crowd, it's a fever pitch, and that's what he notices? Amidst all the problems, amidst all the debates, and all, amidst all the pressures that he's under, facing death, he's, that's what he notices? And really, it's not so much, you know, what it was, it was when it was. What he noticed mattered to his heart. And would we say what matters to Jesus would matter to us? We should take note of what Jesus notices. All the rich folks with their robes and pride and theological and intellectual superiority and their large donations, Jesus, he really wasn't moved. In fact, he was flipping over tables. The lowly widow pretty much unnoticed by the crowd or anybody else, underappreciated, probably deemed worthless by society, Jesus notices. What does he notice about her that stands out? Well, there's your first one, a noble heart. She has a noble heart. God has first place in her life. 
God has first place in her life. God owns everything. God doesn't get the leftovers. Some of you ought to think about that in your own life. God doesn't get the leftovers. Or even 10%. God got it all. And whose is it anyway? It's all God's. Everything. Watch. Give and it will be given you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Interesting phraseology. Can we infer also from the passage that give and it will be given unto you? Yeah. Don't give and it... Uh-huh. And exactly what would be given to you? Or exactly what wouldn't be given to you? Spiritual insight? Wisdom? Knowledge? Peace? You think it's about money? Abundance? More money. How about divine understanding? Give and it will be given you. Give forgiveness and it will be given you. Give mercy and it will be given you. Give grace and it will be given you. Don't give mercy. Give money. God is your provision. Give kindness. God is your protector. Give trust. Trust will be given. He also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Who are you listening to? Who are you following? Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like the teacher. So if you want to know what's going on with the widow and the encounter and all the stuff that's happening, take notice. What is he saying about this widow? Look at her heart. This is what matters. They gave out of their abundance. She gave all she had. They gave a tithe. She gave it all. They wanted admiration. She stayed humble, quiet. You know, often tomorrow's President's Day, but it makes me think of our military. In the military, we all, you've probably heard this before too, all gave some, some gave all. If you want a good heart, what it looks like, look at this lady. Not the teachers of the law, not the rabbis, not the Sadducees, not the scribes. They're all about show. They're all about prestige. They're all about getting admired. They're all about ready. They're all about ready. The law. See, now people get ants in their pants when they start talking about the love of money in the church or start talking about money within the church. We need to get people to follow the tithe, pastor. Then they argue it's the law. Well, it's the Old Testament. We don't have to follow the law anymore. No, no, no. You are so far above the law. Just like the widow. What does God think of her? What do you think of her? The law is limiting. It's restrictive. It's all the things we talk about. The law, the law, the law, yeah. And yet we, some people will, we, we're, not, we're, we're not supposed to tithe. We, we have the, the, you're so, yeah, you're not restricted by that. Please give 30%. What are you thinking? She has the heart of a winner, not a whiner. She has the heart of a follower, not a complainer. She has a noble heart of being a cheerful giver because she understands it all belongs to God. The noble heart doesn't always look like you think it does. The righteous don't always look like you think they're going to look. Best-selling authors and $1,000 suits, social prominence, prestige, fame, TV shows. It takes a lot of money to prop up an image. Just ask the Pharisees. No good tree bears bad fruit. Nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from the briars. 
A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. What kind of heart do you have? What kind of heart are you cultivating? What kind of heart are you nurturing? What kind of heart do you want? And what's your heart saying to you right now? Watch out for those Pharisees. They give for show. Watch out for those Pharisees. Don't make them your heroes. Watch out for those Pharisees. They rob the widows and feed themselves up and they prop up their images. The noble heart gives God first place. The noble heart gets noticed by Jesus. The noble heart. All those others were tithing. They didn't get noticed. A noble heart got noticed. A noble heart is generous. A noble heart is kind and charitable. A noble heart gives because it loves. A noble heart gives because they want to see the gospel preached. A noble heart gives to the church to advance that gospel. A noble heart gives because, well, the Lord says give. He commands you give. We give because we believe God can multiply that which is given with a noble heart. We give to support the growth and the stability of a church, this church in this community. I think one of the best investments you could ever make is to make certain that your community has a good Bible-based church where people can come and hear about Jesus Christ and the Bible and the scriptures and salvation. That's one of the best investments I think you can make. See, here's your next slide. See, churches, they rarely have money problems. Their churches have heart conditions. Talking about heart conditions in Sunday school this morning, weren't we? The condition of the soil, the heart. Some it's rock solid, hard, man, right? Some the world's just going to come and rob. Some are going to take root. Churches don't have money problems. They have heart problems. New Life Alliance Church, we have good hearts. We have generous hearts. We have a heartbeat that is strong for Jesus, right? So as a pastor, I would take the pulse of our church. And with a heartbeat that is good, It longs for a deeper walk. It longs for a deeper connection with God. Our heart is inviting and it's welcoming. The heart of this fellowship produces good fruit. This church is a working church with a good heart, a good noble heart. You're the church. You're the church. The good Lord will fund his work and his people. Pretty simple statement. I pray we continue to have good hearts. Be cheerful and generous with a good heart condition. Healthy hearts beat with the love of Christ. They beat with generosity and sacrifice. You know, I went to the doctor the other day, and what are those, they measure your heart, one of those EKG things, right? So I go to the doctor and say, you're going to do one of those EKG things on me? He said, well, we might want to have your eyes checked first because this is the bank. The earth is the Lord. They don't get any better. It's, it's, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. This is understanding superior stewardship. Understanding superior stewardship. That says time, talent, and treasures on the tree. Bearing good fruit. Or not. This widow is exercising stewardship. She gave it all. God owns it all anyway. Understanding biblical stewardship will go a long way in helping us walk the way God desires us to walk as individuals and collectively as a body of believers and not getting stuck in the ways of the world, not getting stuck in the doctrines of religion, but understanding biblical stewardship is one of the key lessons for us leading a life of the disciple of Christ. Does anybody in here Interested in being a disciple of Christ. If you've been baptized, that's one of the statements you make. I believe in the forgiveness of my sins, and it is my desire to be a disciple of Christ. Being a good steward, listen, is an ethical responsibility, an ethical way of life, an ethical way of holding values. Ethics may not seem like a theological term, but I can assure you, 
It is. Ethics fits into all areas of your life, personally and professionally, like spirituality. It fits into all parts of your life. Now, one of the things that helped me understand proper biblical stewardship and comprehending ethics is that ethical responsibility, ready? Somebody may even know the word, fiduciary. Fiduciary. You have a fiduciary responsibility toward God. A fiduciary is a person who holds a legal or an ethical relationship of trust with another person. Typically, you would find it like this. Like a, a bank has a fiduciary responsibility to handle your money properly. An investment broker has a fiduciary responsibility to handle your investment wisely. A, a lawyer has, a, has to represent you well in the purchase of a home or, or in a criminal court. They have an ethical responsibility, a fiduciary relationship with you. Ethical responsibility on your behalf. Everybody follow me on that? This isn't too complicated, is it? In our case, I would suggest this. You're the banker. You're the lawyer. You're the broker. Not the one making the deposit. You're the one overseeing the deposit. You're the one overseeing the information that's been given to you. See, you have a fiduciary responsibility toward God. One of trust that he has placed upon you. An ethical obligation. This is not, oh, I have a good heart. I am a noble heart like the previous point. We have noble hearts and good and generous hearts. No, no this is more like, am I an ethical person? Do I have integrity? Will I assume the responsibility on behalf of someone else? Or would I reject that? I realize I own nothing. That everything comes from God. We love to say that in church. Hey, everything comes from God. Okay, well then, it's all his. I simply manage it for him. You simply manage it for him. Personal, professional, spiritual, right? And really, what, what do you think you own? What do you think you own? Well, I own my car. I got my title right here. Got my name on it. I own my house. Paid off, mortgage-free, baby. I own my house. I got a bank account, joint rights with tenants, right? With rights of survivorship. I own that. Yeah, but again, okay, for how long? How long? How long? Maybe, maybe you got 100 years in that house. Maybe you got 100 years in that car. Maybe you got 100 years with that. Maybe, maybe. Maybe. Then what? See, you don't even own your own life. Your days are numbered. Yes. You can't even prolong your own life. What do you possibly think you own? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And the reality is this is all fleeting. It is all fleeting. It's a vapor. It's a mist. It's a blink in time. You are a blink in time. And you get the privilege of some money for a while. You get the privilege of a house or a home for a while or a car for a while. You get the privilege. What you have also with that privilege is a responsibility and accountability before God for your fiduciary responsibility. If it's all God's and it is God's and I got a house... If it's God's and it's all God's and I got a bank account, what do you think you possibly own? If it's God's and it's all God's and I got me a car, baby, what? You'll be held accountable, Christian. And may I even say it this way? Maybe even to a higher standard. This is a fundamental understanding in our approach to the correct attitudes toward money, toward possessions. We don't own anything. 
We're entrusted with a certain amount of money. We're entrusted with a certain amount of time. We're entrusted with a certain amount of talent, ability. See, and it's not just about what you are. It's about when you are. Right here, right now, with all that God has entrusted you with. And listen, folks, Jesus notices. He notices. He notices your heart. He notices the heart. What you have to be used for his glory and for his honor and to advance his good name. Or did you just want to improve your image? So folks, I'm giving you a lifetime's worth of information and a 30-minute sermon. Take notes, right? Listen, you can't serve two masters. I tried. You won't win that. You won't win that. You have the greatest news that a soul could ever have. You have the good news that every soul needs to hear. The best news that any soul could ever hope to even find. We are the ambassadors for Christ. We are his body. We are his hands. We're his feet. We're his voice. He entrusts us with money, and he entrusts us with talents, and he entrusts us with a certain amount of time, and he fills us with himself so that he can accomplish it because you never could. We yell out, Woo! Love you, Lord. Man, praise God, praise God, praise God. Lord, I trust you. Everything's yours. Everything's yours. I trust the Lord. Oh, and then the next question is this. Can the Lord trust you? Jody, can the Lord trust you? All those other ones fancied up and given for show and praying lengthy prayers and making certain everybody knows they tithe, meaningless. Jesus notices something else. What's he going to notice about you? Melinda and I used to find ourselves, I don't want to say it this way, I would find myself complaining a lot. Because she wouldn't. And we would say to each other, those that have been given much, much is required. We'd complain about stuff. Too much stuff, too much church, too much stuff, 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 stuff. Those that have been given much, much is required. Integrity, stewardship fiduciary responsibilities and obligations. Here's a good financial tip. Right? From a CFP, chartered advisor in philanthropy, right? So some folks do not have more because they do not do what's right with what they've already been given. You've probably heard me say that countless times up here. But many people who want more, desire more, would like more, much is required, but they don't have more. Why? Because they're not doing what's right with what they've already been given. How do you handle the grace that's been given to you? Give it away. How do, how do you handle the forgiveness that God has poured out upon you lavishly? Give it away. And the mercy and the kindness that he shows you you, you see, if you don't give it away, I preached on this before too, you're a damn problem. You're a damn problem. You damn everything up. It, there's nothing flowing from you. And many don't have more because God's not a, how did you say it? He's, you're not a conduit. You're not a conduit. You're just, you hoard it all for yourself. All that grace and all that mercy and all that kindness and all that forgiveness and all that love and all that money and all that, it's just all for you. Because God wants to bless you and he does. And he will. But can he trust you to bless others? To give it away? To be the hands and feet of Christ? God is not measuring how big the amount is, right? When you're talking about looking at the widow's might. He's not measuring how big the amount is. God is, God is measuring proportion, not amount. 
He's measuring a proportion, not amount. She gave it all. She gave all, though much less than everyone else. Really? Was it less? What are you measuring? See, are you measuring the world's way, the American way, or are you measuring God's way? Defining success, the American's way or God's way, do you, do you, you can begin to see with godly eyes. It's not the American way. It's not the European way. It's not the Australian way. It's not the African way. It's not the Russian way. It's not the communist way. It's not the Republican way. It's not the democratic way. It's God's way of seeing things and viewing things. And how are you measuring? Measuring. Measuring. Anybody have we? Measuring. That's nah, old. Old school. Are you measuring what counts? And are you measuring what matters to God? Are you only measuring what matters to the Democrats or the Republicans or the... Sacrificial giving, everybody else gives out of their wealth. To give a tithe was nothing to them. It wasn't even a hardship for them. Some don't give because it's a hardship. But giving in a hardship is noticed more by God than those that were actually tithing. Out of their wealth. Some people just write checks, not a problem, not a problem, not a problem. No hardship for me, no hardship for me, no hardship for me, no hardship for me. There's no sacrifice in that. And then this little old lady gives a way big proportionate amount. That's what gets noted. Begin to understand that and see that? Or is money your God? Is money your idol? Is money what you worship? She had a noble heart. She understood biblical stewardship. And she had a fiduciary responsibility for all that was entrusted to her. And she knew all her blessings came from above, which meant she had a strong faith. There's your next one. A strong faith. A strong faith will be evident in a person's life. A strong faith shows itself in various ways, through prayer, generosity, kindness, patience. Strong faith trusts God. Strong faith trusts God, even when you give it all away. A strong faith trusts God when you pack it all up and you move to West Palm Beach, Florida. A strong faith trusts God when you pack it all up and you move to Jordan. A strong faith trusts God even when the diagnosis is cancer. A strong faith trusts God, relies on the creator to sustain and to provide. A strong faith operates in the littlest of things, even in the littlest of gifts, even in the littlest acts of kindness, the smallest faith like a mustard seed, like two little coins. It's about the heart. It's not about the amount. Can you trust the Lord with your soul? Can you trust the Lord with your health? Can you trust the Lord in your strong faith with your children? Can you trust the Lord with a job and a career? Can you trust the Lord with your money? And if you can trust the Lord, and in turn, the Lord can trust you, you're beginning a strong walk as a disciple. You've broken down a lot of barriers that many people will not walk through, like prayer. They won't pray for anybody else, ever. And you're a damn problem when it comes to prayer. God can't use you. And when it comes to your money, you become a damn problem because God can't use you. But if the Lord can trust you, and you will trust him, and he will trust you, you can move into this place of a deeper walk with God, and you walk the good life. There's your next one. It's the good life. Anybody want the good life? I want the good life. Now listen, as soon as I say that, want the good life? What does that even mean to you? What's your definition? Probably different than your definition. Probably different than your definition. Probably different. What's the good life? You know what my mom used to say was the good life? If you have your health, you have everything. She was not a wealthy woman, or really a healthy woman at the end of her life. But if you have your health, you have everything, a good life. What does a good life even mean to you? More stuff? More stuff. More responsibility? Right? The accumulation phase, and then there's the conservation phase, and then there's the distribution phase. That's life. I want the good life. Accumulate, 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 accumulate. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. 
distribute it to me now. I want to live, I want to live, I want to live, I want to retire. That's basically everything that's going on when it comes to some of this, right? More stuff? What's the good life? I thought accumulating a bunch of stuff would be the good life. I thought it was the American way. Listen, I'm an all-American. I turned, right, turned into another house to pay bills for, another insurance premium, another tax bill, another repair, another register. More insurance. Sure, amass an empire and watch it rot. Amass an empire and watch it age and fade away. More sex? Just one more girl, one more girl, one more girl, one more girl. Just what? You know what? No death to her relationship at all. Oh, the sex was great. I can't stand it when she talks. More drugs? More drugs, more drugs, more drugs, more drugs. This is what makes me happy. This is what makes me happy. This is what makes me addicted. This is what makes me moody. This is what makes me pollute my body. Good life? Fame. Can't walk your dog without a scandal being put on the tabloids. Front page news. What's the good life in your own head? What does that really look like? These are hard lessons. I've learned some of these hard lessons. The good life may not be what you think it is. I'm one of those idiots that travels down roads to realize I don't want to go down that road anymore. I got to go down this road. Oh, no, no, that's not the road I want to go down. I need to go down this road. How about some peace and quiet? Wow. That sounds like a good life. Lead me beside the quiet waters. I shall not want. Ooh, a whole different meaning. How about some tranquility? How about time to walk on the beach, holding hands? Or just go fishing, drink a beer with your brother? How about more time with the grandchildren? A good life. More barbecues with friends, with no agenda. Campfires, gosh. See, the good life doesn't always seem as complicated as we can make it out to be. Be sure you know what you're thinking about and what is the good life and what are you striving for. And I can promise you this, Jesus notices. And I, I'm pretty sure he notices us. And, and I think he wants a good life for us. But what does that mean? Does it mean the same thing to you as it does to him? And would you venture to again say that what he notices and what matters to him should matter to us? They say, you know, you only get this one life. Do you? Here's your next slide. Are you prepared for the good life? Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to just be here together, brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray you would work within our hearts, Father. Challenge us, change us, inspire us, encourage us. Father, we're all coming from different places, different ways, different ways of thinking. And Father, by your Holy Spirit, I would pray you would minister into our hearts. Minister into our minds. Show us that you are alive and real. Father, I pray you would help us break down any barriers, walls that are up in defensiveness. But Father, that we would be open to receive that which you would have for us. And Father, we all want the good life. We all want the good life. Here and there. Father, I would pray that even now we would recognize we own nothing. And our eternity with you starts now. Not after we lose this body. Not after we lay this tent of flesh aside. But right now. Make us, guide us, lead us to be heavenly minded, kingdom minded, warriors for Christ. We give it all to you, Lord. We lay it all down right here right now, for your honor and for your glory. In the name of your Son, amen.
God bless you guys. Really? Speaking of money, let's pray for an offering. <laughs> Sounds good. The gentlemen would prepare themselves, make their way forward, then we'll pray. Powerful message. And like he said, it's time to take an offering. We're talking about money. And let's just ask God, after the message we heard this morning, where do we stand? Can we come to the Father, the Father of God, and ask him, what can I do? Can I give more? Just speak to our hearts. Let him speak to our hearts. That's each and every one of us. Father, we do give you the praise and the glory. You're an awesome God, a mighty God. You are on the throne. And, Father, we're thankful, Father, for the way you have blessed us right here at New Life Alliance through some trying times in the last four or five years, Lord, and even before that. But, Father, we're so thankful, God, that you have blessed us the way you have. You have kept us. And we just give you the praise and the glory for that. And, Father, as we have this opportunity right now to give that back to which you have blessed us with, God, that we would just, Father, give with a cheerful heart. And, Father, I think the literal interpretation of that is give with a hilarious heart. Wow. Imagine that. But, God, let us not be burdened. But let us feel free, let us feel that, and know that we're doing the right in our giving. So, Father, just search our hearts, but we do thank you, Father, for that which will be received right now, and may it be con continued to be a blessing to New Life Alliance, to an outreach, the ministry, and we just give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Would you stand with me, please? So from now on, we are to regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Go, serve your God. God bless you.